Hi, everybody. My name is Alan. On behalf of the crew, I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Bridging Heaven and Earth. Hmm. Well, I, you know, I think most everybody knows we're living really in extraordinary times in just so many ways that, you know, they're tricky, they're explosive, they're powerful, they're amazing, they're unbelievable. You know, and maybe, you know, truth be told that just to be in a human body at any time was an extraordinary gift, an extraordinary experience, an extraordinary experiment. But somehow it just seems like right here, right now, that the energies are really percolating, the energies are really expanding on an extraordinary level. The energies we talked about on a, you know, on a show before about being erratic and in a sense chaotic and uh, you know tricky to maneuver in a way, tricky to have a human body and to, to deal with all the forces of... Uh, you know, there's a lot of energy around separation, which there always has been, but now it's building as we come into a more of an experience of cooperation and collaboration and oneness. And there's issues around health and uh, relationships and money and foreclosures and economies and uh, economic systems and... Uh, revolutions in places and dictatorships and democracies and you know how do we put all the pieces together and you know it's tricky business having this human body at this time it seems to me you know for almost everybody that it's just tricky and basically it's it's driving us into an experience of, of being in the moment of that's the only place that the real understanding the real experience, the real peace, the real uh, realization of who we are lives. And we're being forced into that because everything else is just shaking and shifting and changing. And yet in light of that, what we're seeing so much here at Bridging and what we're seeing all over the planet is that we're being gifted with so many beings, with so many gifts to, to, to guide us, to help us, to... Uh, harmonize, to balance us, to bring us tools, to bring us gifts, to bring us experiences, to help us bridge heaven and earth, to help us come into balance, to help us come into an experience of oneness. And we at Bridging see it so much. I mean, literally, we get you know books and tapes and new websites and new uh, workshops and new... Um, tools being offered by people all over the planet. I mean, literally every week we get books and tapes and PR people sending us about this uh, event and this workshop from people all over the planet. And even us here at Bridging who've been involved in this literally, you know, 24 seven for 20 years now, at least. We've been doing the show for 17 years. Have never heard of these people. And it's, you go, my God, how, how is this happening? How is it possible that these people are doing so many extraordinary things that we who've been involved in this spiritual journey and, and people reaching out to us because of the bridging format and you know the ability to reach people through the show all over the world, and we've never heard of them. So just so many people are, are really so gifted and we're so blessed and fortunate to have these helpers and guides and, and collaborators here with us now. And one of those is our guest tonight, Kiki Corbin. She's a spiritual teacher. She's a healer. And she was born spiritually gifted and was con continually aware as, when, as she was growing up of the other side, of other forces, of that this wasn't, this third dimension wasn't all there was, that there was something more, that there was something more expansive, more inclusive, more infinite. And as a child, she was drawn uh, by a deep yearning to learn spiritual wisdom, to serve others, and to understand the meaning of, li of life. And that is basically what her life has been about. And she's had uh, uh, survived three near-death experiences where basically she was shown through different teachers and guides uh, the wisdom of the universe. And 
you know, as from, from a child until this very day. I mean, she basically dedicated her life to feeling the love and sharing it and sharing joyously and lovingly the wisdom and the gifts she's been given. And we're extraordinarily fortunate to have Kiki with us here to share her gift with us and you and just to bring that beautiful healing energy to us. So that's going to be great. And as most of you know, we usually have music videos and art music videos. And tonight we have two music videos that are very beautiful and very powerful from two real old friends of bridging. Barry Goldstein has this beautiful video, Through the Eyes of God. It's the first video we've shown of Barry, but we've known him. He's almost been a guest a couple of times. We couldn't work out the logistics. But a real gifted, new age, musical healer and uh, extraordinary talent. So there's a beautiful video from him. And then uh, someone who we've been in a, a lot of collaboration with recently, Guru Ganesha, another person who we just haven't worked out the dates to, uh, for him to be a guest on Bridging, but he, sh he sent us a lot, a lot of videos. And today we're showing another of his with his band, the Guru Ganesha Band, and featuring one of his uh, players, uh, Hans Christian. And also, as most of you know, we're in the middle of an extraordinary healing art project that came as a vision, it came as a dream, as a healing, as an acupuncture for the planet, as a, a healing of that separation, a healing of that, uh, healing the heart of the planet, of, of reconnecting us to our oneness, to our love. And what we were guided to, to reach out was to, to reach out to everyone through the show, through our website, through newsletters, that anybody who wants to produce a new original piece based on the theme Bridging Heaven and Earth, get it to us here. We'll put it on the show. We'll have uh, art, art exhibits. We'll have, uh, try to get them into hospitals, into museums. Um, and we have a beautiful studio gallery here where we rotate about 50 pictures. And we have a wonderful, wonderful, powerful, inspiring uh, website, uh, heaventoearthart.com, that features all the art that's come in from, from all over the world for the International Healing Art Project. We've received probably over 375 pieces as of this moment, all sizes, all shapes. Anybody, any, any skill level, any age, any country, any format, any medium, you get it to us here, and we will feature it on the show. And literally, we've gotten all kinds of sculptures and acrylics and oils and uh, collages and glass and jewelry and uh, just everything, really. Everything has come in because all it is is some, anybody's desire to be part of the creativity, the collaboration, uh, the healing, and the love. So we really encourage anybody who's interested at all, go to Heaven to Earth Art and just look at this page after page of this extraordinary loving and healing art that's come in, all different from all over the planet. And really, it'll blow you away. And the more people involved, the better the healing, the more the collaboration, the more the love. And that's what we're here to do, and we're here to share it all over the world. So join me in a short meditation, then we'll have the Barry Goldstein video, and then we'll have Kiki, and then the Guru Ganesh video, and and we're going to have beautiful pieces of art from Cheryl Waller and uh, Arlene Boyce, who's done a lot of pieces. Cheryl did five pieces. Arlene's done about five pieces. So it's not even limited by the number of pieces. If you feel to joyously and lovingly manifest pieces for the International Healing Art Project, we welcome them just with great honor and great delight. So join me in a short meditation. Thank you. So as I said, the first video will be Barry Goldstein, Through the Eyes of God. It's from Barry's album, The Movement. Uh, you'll love it. It's just very beautiful. Barry's just a really beautiful being. Through the Eyes of God. Enjoy. <laughs> Brilliant. 
Hi, everybody. Welcome back. So Barry Goldstein, Through the Eyes of God, beautiful. Beautiful video, beautiful vocals, beautiful. And that's from Barry's album, The Movement. Special thanks to, to Barry for letting us have that and sending it to us. And the beautiful piece of healing art you see in between Kiki and I is by Cheryl Waller. It's called Her Majesty. It's a photograph. Uh, Cheryl is from Wichita, Kansas, United States. Her website is cwaller, that's C-W-A-L-L-E-R, photography.com. And here's what she says about when she produced, manifested this piece, Her Majesty. I used the vibration of Virginia Williams singing and piano playing to allow the incense smoke to expose its gift to, human to humanity from the fifth dimension. This picture is a portal for healing and raising vibration. So, beautiful. And really, we've gotten so many incredible pieces from all over. Cheryl has done five. The second piece you'll see today from Arlene. Arlene has done five. Go to the website, really. No matter what you're experiencing today, to, to be at that website, to see that art, to, see, to feel that energy is a great gift. So, we encourage everybody to do it. So, we're on the set with Kiki. Welcome. Thank you. Great to have Wonderful you here. to be here. Yeah, it's great. Uh, so at the opening, I said that really from early on in your life that you had di almost different experiences than other people and had recognition of other realms and other forces. Why don't you talk about that and how it affected you growing up and whether your parents and friends responded to that, didn't, were you weird? <laughs> Well, I was lucky because I was raised on a farm in Central California with uh, in a very big Greek family, big grandparents, mother and brother, cousins, aunts and uncles, you know, a lot of people to deal with, like a village. <laughs> and my grandmother was very, very mystical. She's quite the mystic. And people would drive 100 miles, 200 miles to come talk to her, an amazing woman. And so I was raised in an environment where at breakfast time we'd all be sitting around and my grandmother would say to everybody, well, what did you dream about last night? Who came to visit you? What did they have to say? What message did they have for the family? So in our family it was very normal. Wow. And, and why don't you talk about your experiences growing up that way and how, what experiences you had and how you knew it wasn't, it was from another side, that it wasn't in exactly in the third dimension. Well, I didn't look at it quite that, because I hadn't studied, you know, I just right. was how life was. Right. Um, perhaps as I got a little older and went to school, because back then there weren't preschools, so you just went to school when you were in kindergarten. Um, then I think I noticed that other kids were different. I didn't think I was different. <laughs> I mm -hmm. thought they were different. Right. And because it was just such a natural part of life, it was never anything unusual. I know that sounds a little strange in our society, but it just wasn't. Um, I remember once my mother came in from the field. She was a farmer and a school teacher. And the, she had seen my grandfather, who had passed quite a few years before, out in the field full body. And she came in with her eyes really wide saying, I just saw Papa. Papa came and, and to talk to me. You know, I was up in the field, and she was so excited. And my grandmother was always just so calm and just asked her questions. You know, but I was there and got to, you know, hear the whole thing. But it was just normal. It wasn't anything unusual. So I didn't separate it. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. But I also had a great opportunity because we lived in the country, and it was in the San Joaquin Valley where it's really hot in the summer. You know, like I just drove through there, it was 109, I think. And we would lay out on the grass, my brother and I, and we'd look at the stars and we would just contemplate infinity and have conversations like that. Really wonderful, mm. great freedom. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. And so how, you know, in this process of, you know, recognizing your gifts and recognizing your service, why don't you take people through your life where those and the big moments and the near-death experiences so they get a feel for how you came to you know appreciate your gifts experience your gifts wanting to share your gifts wanting to to serve knowing what what your service was things like that well the most fun thing was when I was 16 the Beatles went to uh, India to study with the Maharishi and something awoke 
became awakened in me, and I said, I'm going to learn to meditate, but there was nobody to teach you to meditate in those days, and um, I just always followed what they did. I went to the local bookstore in our little town, and I ordered Maharishi's first book, The Science of Being and Art of Living, and I tried so hard to read it. I mean, it was so just totally foreign. And I thought that maybe somebody could help me understand it, but nobody was interested. You know, so I just went on until I went to college. It took that long before I ever met anybody who had any interest in meditation or knew anything about it of any form, not just Eastern, just anything. So after that, um, I went to college. I was a mathematics major and um, because I was good at it, not because I loved it so much. And I became a statistician, and I absolutely hated the work. And uh, I became Pretty dry. A, oh, it's just so not me. But right. I was good at it. Yeah. You know, that's I was at Sacramento right. State, and I worked for the for the <coughs> state. And I uh, I started. I still had that yearning to meditate. I was in my early twenties, twenty one, twenty two, and I was looking for a teacher. Finally, found a teacher who taught. Um, oh, what was she teaching? Um, I'll think of it in a second. And Just a form of meditation. Yeah, a form of meditation, right. yes. And um, so I studied with her, and my third meditation, I had a life-changing experience where Jesus literally came to me in my meditation and told me I was to be a minister. And at the time, I was a student, and, you know, partying like normal kids do. And my reaction was, and I, this kind of set up a pattern for my life, of um, being rather rebellious around religion and anything having to do with God. And I just said, no way. You know, if this is real, I must, you know, I'm not the right person. Yeah, <laughs> right. You must have came. You must have made right. a mistake. Right. God. Right. Yes, right. 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 Yeah, you right. don't know what you're talking about. I'm right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I quit meditating. That's how serious I was about it. I thought either I had slipped a cog or I just was, didn't want, I just wasn't the right person. But about six months later, I started to have um, many, you know, desires again to meditate. It was very strong in me in those days. I mean, it still is because I meditate every day, but um, back then it was just very strong. And so as soon as the first meditation, as soon as I started again, here he comes again. <laughs> Wow. And this time I thought about it, and I said, you know, if this happens again, maybe it will be real. And perhaps, you know, I'll just say yes and see where it takes me. What are you going to do, right? right. <laughs> so that was that experience that I became. I, went, I totally changed. I went into psychology. I went to a different college and prepared myself for seminary. Really, to actually go to the seminary? Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. take us. Yeah, take us through that. So, I mean, you never went to a seminary, right? No, I went for three years. You did yeah. go. Yeah. I, yeah, after I graduated, yeah, I then, got a degree in psychology, and then I moved here to Santa Barbara, and I took a year off, and then I went to the Ernest Holmes School of oh, Ministry. Holmes, yeah. And back then, there was just one campus in Los Angeles, and I commuted from here to Los Angeles to school every week. Wow. Yeah. And, and was that science of mind? Yes. Yeah, science, science of mind. Yeah. And so you became a science of mind minister. Mm -hmm. But then in, in, in reading your bio, I, I saw that you had three near-death experiences that really were, were pivotal events in your life. And did they come later? Yes. yes. Okay, why don't you talk to that? So you, now you're this minister. Well, I was a minister, and at the same time I had met Swami Satchidananda here in Santa Barbara. He had a little ashram here. And I became a student of his. Thank God I did. He helped me so much. And he was m a lot with yoga, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Right. And right. I became a certified Hatha Yoga instructor and okay. a meditation right. teacher. Yeah, it was just a one. Those were wonderful years. I just treasure, treasure those yeah, years. Lovely. Yeah. And he came very regularly. And we had uh, a week every year retreat at cr over Christmas and New Year's. And every year I went and it, we, you know, it was just divine. Mm -hmm. I used to call going to his training a yoga boot camp. <laughs> Uh -huh, right. <laughs> so it was very strict and nothing like anything I'd ever been exposed to before, but I just loved it. It was mm -hmm. great. Um, yeah, so I did that, and then um, after three years, um, after I finished school, and um, I was t 
trying to figure out where I was going to be working, um, I didn't, I couldn't move because I was married then uh, to a local here, and there were no jobs open locally. And so a group of my friends and I got together and said, well, what are you going to do? We all prayed on it, meditated on it, and we all got that we should start a new church. Wow. So we started the Montecito Community Church in uh, Montecito. Wonderful experience. And you were the minister there from yeah. the from the get go. Yeah. And how long did you do that? I did three years, and then the third year, um, I'd gone through a divorce, and my husband left me. <laughs> and then um, was that because of that he wasn't lining up with this ministry with the way your life was moving? Probably. Yeah. We're we're friends now. It's good. Uh -huh. um, and he's the father of my children, and we're. You know, right. Yeah. Our lives right. are like this, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a lot of connections. Yeah. 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 Thank God, we just have worked out a lot of things over the years. Right. <laughs> but back then, it was very heartbreaking, and I had a big congregation, a lot of responsibilities, and it was really challenging, very challenging. And I wasn't seeing my children very often. And um, I remember one. This is what changed everything. I came home one day, and I, my kids hadn't seen me for three days, and they were crying. They were in preschool. They were crying and saying, And they were with their father? No, they were at home with a nanny. Home we had a nanny. nanny. Right, the father was already yeah. out of the picture. Right? Yeah, he had moved to San right. Luis Obispo. Right. And so I just went, something's the matter with this picture. You know, I'm mothering all these people, these other families, and I can't even take care of my own children. So within six months, I, I moved to Bend, Oregon. And I continued the part of the ministry I love the most, which is pastoral counseling. And all those years, actually here in Santa Barbara, I started, um, I used to volunteer for hospice, and I was their non-denominational minister. And I also took the training to be an in-home volunteer because I wanted to learn what that experience was. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get that kind of experience as a minister. Mm -hmm. And during those years, I learned that I was um, very attracted to holistic healing. Back then, this is 30 years ago, Santa Barbara was just a hotbed of acupuncture homeopathy, all those things, chiropractic, way before other cities. Right. So I wanted to learn. So I started studying then. And then over the years, I kept taking courses and courses. And eventually, I became a certified naturopath. So now I do all of it. I do natu naturopathy, and I do pastoral counseling. And then now I've written my book. And so now I'm an author, and I, I do lectures and uh, workshops. All about helping people heal and be well and happy. Oh, beautiful! Yeah. yeah that's beautiful. But so talk. I mean, I know that, that that we talked a little earlier, and I saw in your bio that these near-death experiences. When did they come in, and what was the the impact of them for you, and moving you, and expanding your experience and your wisdom, and you know, wanting to share it now? Um, when I turned forty. It was the only birthday I've ever had where I was actually depressed. I thought I was so old. <laughs> Isn't that funny when you look back on things like that? And um, very shortly after, I was living in Montana at the time, and I was remarried in a pretty miserable marriage. Everything else was wonderful. I had a pastoral counseling practice in town. I was my kids. I was a 4-H leader. I was just very active. And we had a horse ranch, a championship paint horse ranch. Just wonderful. All different parts were just wonderful. Um, had a great meditation group there and um, taught yoga. I was the first yoga teacher in that in Kalispell, Montana. In fact, I was just there recently and I got to, ran into a number of my old students. It was so nice. They all thanked me. It was, you know, I never thought of it back then. You just kind of do what you do, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so one day I, I was leaving work. This weather was really good, and I said, I'm going to go home my, and ride my horse because in uh, November, the weather's never really good in Montana. And it was it's always just, snowy and cold. Usually and starting by right. then, yeah. And it was sunny and, and beautiful, which this is normally not. So I went home. Right. I don't remember any the rest of that whole experience, but the only part I remember is the near-death experience. And um, what happened was I found myself in the light, leaving the earth, very physically felt I was leaving. Um, Jesus was next to me, and we were talking just like normal friends would talk, you know, just about whatever we're doing. <laughs> and 
little by little, we became more and more subtle. And the light was so bright, it was like um, a thousand suns more. Just it, it would blind your, your physical eyes if you were to see such bright light physically. And we were going out, and I started hearing laughter. And I asked him, by then things were getting telepathic, I asked him what the laughter was, and he, he said it was, and by then it was, things were starting to become pretty instantaneous. And something I've learned about telling, my, not just my story, because I've interviewed a number of people from my book, um, that we say it in this world in a linear way, but the reality is it's kind of like instant. A lot of things sometimes happen all at one time, but that wouldn't make for a very good story if you said it that way, because it makes you sound a little goofy. Um, the uh, I, I understood in a very global way that what they were laughing about, and this has changed my life actually, is that kind of like the juxtaposition of that we are we come and take a body on this earth, and we come from a place of pure light and unconditional love. It's just incredible what you experience there so easily. It's just how life is. And then you take on this body and you take on the beliefs of your family and of your culture and of the world and all the rules and everything that happen here. And we will, the, the, this was, I call this angel humor because it's not really that funny, but they were laughing about it on that side. So I take it, it was funny to them, but on this side, it doesn't sound so funny, but they were laughing because on this earth, we will kill our own relatives, our own brothers and sisters for what we believe. And yet, you know, the real lesson is about love. And so it's, you know, it's a kind of a sadness and a humor all mixed yeah, together. No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's so weird and so ridiculous that it's almost funny. Yeah, well, they were laughing. Right, right. Humongous, like thousands of right. voices laughing. And, um, and then I looked over my shoulder and I looked back at the earth, and I was sh allowed to see, I could see all the belief systems simultaneously on the earth. I was looking at it, and I could perceive them all simultaneously. And I could see how individuals, every single individual, has their own personal belief system, even though everybody, they are similar to somebody else. And then um, I also saw how they melded together and how they created reality. And now that's the part that really changed my life because here I taught we are our thoughts, our thoughts are things we create with our minds. I never really understood how. And then also I got to actually experience seeing that. That was pretty amazing. Right. At the time I didn't feel amazed because right. afterwards looking back on it right. I felt amazed. At the time it was just normal. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So after that we went to a place further. We kept going out far, far from the earth. And we came to a place where there were 50 or 60 beings. And Buddha was there, and Shiva was there, and many other, the archangels were all there, and many beings I didn't recognize. Muktananda was there, who ended up becoming one of my teachers after that, but I didn't know who he was at the time. Nityananda was there. And um, it was an amazing um, gathering to, to have, you know, you hear stories in other people's near-death experiences that their relatives come and all that kind of thing. I didn't have that kind of an experience at all. It was all about, I call, call them now my counsel. Mm -hmm. And um, they greeted me, and then Jesus and I stood in the middle, and Jesus took me through a life review. And it was kind of like we were in the clouds is how I perceived it. And he was showing me kind of in the clouds pictures of everything, every part of my life. And it, he would ask me, show me a scene. And then he would ask me, how could you have been more loving? And instantly I always knew the answer. And Probably then, wasn't that hard to figure. Because well, <laughs> well, let's get into that next. We'll yeah. take the next video and we'll bring a okay. new piece of art and we'll get into this, you know, what they showed you, which is fantastic. So, okay. <coughs> excuse me. So now we're going to see, as I said, the Guru Ganesha band video uh, featuring Hans Christian. Uh, it's very, very beautiful, very powerful. Uh, Guru Ganesha, enjoy. Bliss is like the nectar. 
of a relationship. And without a deep relationship, there won't be bliss. The exceptional chemistry of this band is producing the bliss. And uh, he and I have a wonderful interplay between uh, guitar and uh, whatever instrument he's playing. So it's like there's a beautiful dialogue that, that goes on in between the uh, phrases. Of course, it also helps to, to play music that has an intention to uplift others to not just be a band that's trying to get a lot of attention, but a band that wants to make a positive impact in this world. And I, I, I think that's what the Kuruka National Band is all about. He seems to select and not only just the right instrument for the, for the particular song. Some songs he plays two or three instruments. Three of the instruments uh, use a bow. A bow on strings really evokes the energy of the heart singer which is why so many of the ladies who come to the concert seem to fall in love with him. Hans, just tell them quickly about your instruments. I've got plenty of instruments left. <laughs> He's a master cellist. He plays uh, sarangi like he was, grew up in India. He played with your cuticles, it's a pretty interesting Indian instrument. He plays sitara, which is a kind of a, a miniature version of a sitar, but he makes it sound like a full sitar. And he plays the nickel harpa, which is this magnificent instrument that comes from Sweden. And it adds so much texture and flavor. The bliss comes from hard work and from remembering that we're loving each other, you know, we're loving playing together. Hi everybody, welcome back. So Guru Ganesha, Hans Christian, you know, thanks guys for sending it. Thanks Spirit Voyage for allowing us to have that. And the extraordinary piece of art you're seeing in between Kiki and I is by Arlene Boyce. It's called Peace. Uh, it's a collage on recycled paper. Uh, Arlene's from North Carolina, USA. Our, her website is Arlene Boyce Art. That's Arlene, uh, A-R-L-I-N-E-B-O-Y-C-E-Art.com. Arlene's done, a, I'd say, four or five pieces now. Go to the website. Go to the artist page. Heaven to Earth Art, the artist page, look up Arlene Boyce by her first name, by A, and look at some of these pieces. So powerful, so beautiful, and everyone is welcome to join us, so please do. So Kiki, we were talking about you and Jesus on a cloud, and everyone was there. Why don't you take us through more of that? So we ended at, I was in the middle of my life review, and to say the least, that experience changed my life because every action ever since that time I've always had to measure against that, knowing that when I really leave this world and I go through a life review again, which I assume I will probably do, um, that's what's important. That's and that's the, the question, important. is could you have been more loving? How could you have been, been more, more loving? loving? So it's just, and, and interestingly, this, is, this has been, I'll tell you an example because it'll help explain it a little bit. Some things were like just an attitude like I was shown at a time, say I'm in a, in a scene with my family, and there, I was raised in this huge family, and there were people you liked some of the time and people you didn't like. And so somebody would be picking on another person, and instead of doing something positive that would help that person that was getting picked on, say I would just keep my mouth shut just to let them just have it because I didn't like them at the moment or I was mad at them about something. And that was a, kind, a lot of those kinds of things were attitudes, like I didn't have a loving attitude or an attitude of feeling connected and at one with my family or friends, whatever. Um, so when that review was over, and oh, another important part is that there was no judgment. This is so important. There was no judgment. It was total unconditional love and total, um, what do I say? Neutrality. Yeah, it was very balance. neutral and it was very holistic like I felt totally enveloped in love and support there was absolutely no judgment 
and none of the questions ever came across as being judgmental. It was just take a look at it, you know, kind of thing. And then after that, we went and became part of the circle, and they had a meeting with me about what my work is, not just here on Earth, but in the, in the universe. And before my work here, I was shown I was supposed to be teaching and writing and that kind of thing. And they showed me with lots and lots of souls, lots of things. And then I started, when it was over, I headed further into the light, knowing exactly where I was going. And Jesus basically stopped me and said, you can't go. You have to go back. And this is the aftermath of this horseback riding yes. accident yes. that happened in Kalispell. Yes. Okay. So. Yeah. And so I did my typical me. And I went, right here. I do not want to go back. Right. <laughs> and he right. says, but you have to go back. Your work's not done yet. And so what do you do? you made to come back. <laughs> so, right, right. so I don't remember coming back to that one. And then it was many years later. I actually had two. And ha tell me how that changed your earthly life. You oh. come back and you're, oh. you know, against some rock, you know, yeah. falling off this horse. And you wake up and you, did you remember everything? I remembered my whole near-death experience. You That's did. actually the only thing I remembered for a right. very and long time. And so you knew that love was the key and love was the root and that we have a lot of ways to go, yeah. attitude, action, to really be unconditionally loving. So how did your life move from that? Well, I had something very unusual happen. Um, I found out now, just recently, it's unusual. I didn't know it was unusual then. I stayed in that light for about three months, even though I was in, back in my body. I was very injured. I had to wear a collar and um, every joint in my body. I was thrown off my horse onto my head. Fortunately, I had a helmet on. Uh, but anymore, I don't even know that that even matters. If you're meant to come back, you're going right. to come back. Right. If you're meant to go, you could be totally healthy and you're right. going to go. So right. Right. I, I don't worry about those things anymore. Right. <laughs> um, but I literally stayed in the light in my body. So I got to experience the reality of experiencing that intense light and there not being any veil between here and what we call over there. None. And I, you know, I was total open. It was, fortunately at the time, I also had a concussion and so it didn't bother me because I wasn't, my memory wasn't working great. My sense of judgment. And you didn't have a lot of activities that responsibilities uh, to do. Oh, I had lots, but I didn't do anything. Yeah, right. I mean, right. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, there was a reason because you were injured and blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah. So. Yeah. It was a gap created for you to really have this experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wasn't functioning right. very well, yeah, right. in those days. And I had a, a pastoral counseling practice, so I couldn't see my patients at the time. And um, and interestingly, one one side effect of it is when I did go back to work, I was much more intuitive, and my patients got well a lot faster. And I wasn't doing naturopathy then, just pastoral counseling. Um, and I, and I also, as the veil started to come back, I realized that I, I was kind of mourning it because I was so just got used to being in this just incredible light. And then I, I realized when somebody came to me for help, and I thought normally I could just immediately know the answer, that, that veil had come back pretty well. And I just closed my eyes and said a little prayer, and then right away it was gone. So it taught me in that instant that I could still have access to that. And that's never changed since then. Yeah. And it's also helped me in teaching because uh, mostly what I teach, even though I talk about near-death experiences, I know now that it's really about a trans, like transformational, uh, transferring light. I don't know what words kind of work right on this planet about that. But the, the image I've been given is like if you go close to a bonfire, you're going to get warm. I don't care if you're in Alaska or you're at the um, you know, equator. You're going to get warm from the bonfire, and it feels like that's on this planet kind of a good analogy of what's happened to me. is like that light switch got turned on, and I was able to just the bonfire got lit, and it just stayed there. <laughs> right. Yeah, we talk about you know, as the water rises, everybody gets wetter. So yeah. as we can all, like I said at the opening, so many people are coming in you know, having these 
real high energetic experiences and we're raising the quantum level towards the hundredth monkey and you know so it's changing the, the water level is rising or the bonfire is getting hotter or, and so it's heating more area so it's hitting more people and I think that's the plan so why don't you talk a little bit about the guidance you got to write the book and how the book's coming and you know I guess by the time this is out it'll be out there on your website kikicorbin.com which we'll you know have on the on your show and so yes, why don't you talk about that a little? Yeah. Well, even though I was told each with each near death experience, and they're all in, in my book, um, after I'd written just my own story, I only had two two chapters. <laughs> and I looked at it and I went, This is not a book, <laughs> right? This is like so little. And I tried to write more and I was done. You know, I didn't have more to write. And so I contemplated it and I prayed on it and I asked all these beings, they've never stopped being around me ever since that time, what I should do. And they said, well, you could write other people's stories. And so I sent an email out to my friends and I said, I'm working on this book and I don't know anybody. Tell, tell the name of the book. Oh, The Gift of Light, gift Stories of, of Hope and Inspiration from Near-Death Experiences. And uh, so little by little over the next few years, people contacted me and it was all from that one first email and then one person would know somebody else and but only the people that came were the ones that worked out I found that very interesting and actually by the time I was done I realized the whole thing's been orchestrated all I've had to do is be the scribe you know just write it down and do my best and, and it's a beautiful book the other thing that's unusual about the book is and this came very strongly that I was to write this was an addition which none of the other near-death experience books have which is spiritual practices that help people experience the light right here and now and then I also have a section on different religions and that actually took the longest of any section to write because I'm not um, a world religion scholar so I had a lot of research to do and I had to talk to find people who were scholars and get them to help me on making short introductions so that because every faith has a mystical branch and they just seemed to think it was extremely important today that no matter what faith you're in or non-faith, there's practices you can do that will help you experience the light. So why don't you kind of take us through a few of these practices, just generally speaking, and okay. you know what would be of value for people, you know, before they could read the book. To okay, you want to actually do one? No? We could do that. You want me just to tell you? Uh, why don't you just talk about it, because okay. I don't know if we have time to really get into one. All right. Slowly. All right. Um, the first, the beginning of it is learning how to breathe properly so that you can totally relax your body. And there's a number of different kinds of breathing practices, and each one takes you into different places. We take breathing so much for granted, but it really is our connection to the divine. We all breathe, right? Until we stop. Yeah, right? until we stop. All <laughs> right. And at that point, we exit right, this place. Right, we're done. Place. We're done yeah. in the third dimension. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's the beginning is breathing and learning to breathe the way we breathed when we were babies. It's a very natural, soft. You know, we take on so many of our some scars, our, our injuries, our woundedness in our bodies, and we constrict how we breathe. And so learning to allow our bodies just to relax and be present in the moment is where the light is, right, in the tiny little moment. And then there's other exercises that are, um, once you st learn the breathing, then and you practice that for a while, then you can add some of the other ones, which are about how to find that little gap in our thinking that lets us like the little eye of the needle you know, to get into infinity. And the, the, what I love, I actually learned a lot writing that section because I did talk to a number of scholars and I got to learn more, even though I studied in college, I got to learn a lot more about the mystical practices from other faiths. So there's just a brief introduction to those with the names and so people can actually look for those things within their own faith. Turned out to be quite lovely, very happy with it. And, and at the root of all these mystical faiths, there is a oneness. I mean, yeah. it's not, they, see, at certain points, different things like countries and religions can have a tendency to, to be separate, mm -hmm. you know, to make us feel separate. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, the root of all these things, especially the, the root of the religion with the Christians and Buddhists, is a oneness, a connection between us all. And 
whether it's a different spoke on the wheel, that's not the important part, mm -hmm. but it's that center. So why don't you talk to that? I know that that was, mm -hmm. you know, probably the main message. When I was um, not in this body, um, and this happened with each near-death experience, I had a sense at this time to think that probably I had so many, just I could really get it, uh -huh. really understand. Yeah, you know, a lot of times we hope that it's not so traumatic. <laughs> yeah, and I really. think that's why we're here, is to raise that level so more and more people could have it without falling off a horse and hitting your head right. and the stuff around your neck. And it's getting that's easier, trauma, right. much easier right. nowadays. If you'll just sit and be quiet a little, or just be a little still, it's getting easier. Right. Yeah, the veils are... Yeah, very thin, very thin, right. very thin you know. Um, yeah, so my experience there is that when you don't have this body and all you are is light, and I, light also is a word we use that's here. My guess is that every word we use here is actually barely a drop in the bucket of yeah, what it's really of like, you know, just a little bit. Um, but the... It's like we are this expanse of light, and what life is like without this body is very equal, and it's different kind of equal than we normally think about. Like we think of equal here as like, well, I have a Mercedes, and that person has a Mercedes, so we're equal. It's not that kind of equal at all. We have this expression, whatever you think you are, you're more. <laughs> so, you know, to go, you know, once, once you're thinking of something, there's always... Yeah, yeah. But without the brain right. and without the ego and without all of our senses, like our sense of touch or sense of smell, sense of sight, we don't have any of that. So we're just beingness. And all beings on the other side, my experience has been, including Jesus, is that we're all equal. And on that side, my sense was we all have our own job. We have our jobs, plural. But we don't, there's no comparison. Like you don't have to go apply for a job and compete with somebody else. I, I no, you have like your that. own destiny. Yeah, you know, every person, every right. being <coughs> is, is perfectly synchronized. And lately, this, this year, what's been a fabulous breakthrough after all these years of <coughs> writing and interviewing and, and <coughs> processing all of this, recently, this, just this year, I'm finally getting that kind of constant awareness that that is our state of being, always. Like, it doesn't just turn on when you leave your body. It is who we are. And getting, even though I spent all those months in the light years ago, I still didn't come out of that period of time just totally integrated with it. But it's not that straightforward or easy in the third dimension uh, for most of us. Uh, right, it's getting easier yeah. and it's getting, yeah. the veils are thinner and... Yeah, we're coming, you know, we talk about the Father and I are one is becoming the Father, the Goddess, and I are one is coming more into people's reality. Mm -hmm. Yes, the sense of who we, our true beingness. And what's very exciting about that to me is that once we understand that, then we get in touch with our true power of creativity because that's what we do here. We create, we create this reality. Oh, well, yeah. and, and we're coming to the end of this creative reality. So it's a perfect ending. So amazing, really, an amazing time. So if anybody wants any information about Kiki, her new book, the art project, call me, Alan, 805-687-2053. That's Alan, 805-687-2053. You know, again, it's an opportunity for us all to be together. It's an opportunity for all to serve together and collaborate and be creative. And it's, 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 the opportunity is here now, and we can do it. So call me anytime, 805-687-2053. Good night. We love you. God bless you.